So we're going through a series right now um, and looking at what is what what makes a healthy church. And um, last week we we looked at our first value, and that is Jesus. And um, and we talked about that this isn't just like we didn't just put Jesus on our values because that's like the thing that we should do just to check that box off. But but what what we talked about is that when we say Jesus is our highest value, we mean friendship with Jesus. We mean that if we come here and do the church thing and we miss having a real friendship with Jesus, then we've missed the whole purpose. We've missed um, why we're here. And so so we talked about that last week and if you weren't here, if you didn't hear that one, it's online. I would encourage you to go and listen to that and it will help you to really um, understand a little bit more about our church. Um, today we're talking about our second value and that is hospitality. And most of you probably come here this morning with sort of some uh, already have some preconceived ideas about what hospitality is, what that's about. But I would um, hope that by the time you leave this morning, that that idea has expanded a little bit. So, so don't, um, don't box this idea in to just maybe having people over to your house. And that's a lot of the times all we think of when we think about hospitality. I want you to sort of come open-minded for the Word of God to show us how much deeper this, this thing called hospitality really goes. The word hospitality in the original Greek language that the New Testament was translated from is the word, um, it, it comes from two root words. Philos, which means to be actively friendly, to be kind, um, and xenos, and that means stranger. And so, you put those two together, philoxenos, and it means to be kind, to be friendly to strangers. Most often in the New Testament where we see this word, it is being used in reference to having, to opening your home to a stranger and having them in. But what we're going to see, we show hospitality, but that the, the, the heart of hospitality uh, has so many more applications and ways of working itself out in our life. You think about what it is that you're actually doing when you open your home to a stranger and say, come in. You're actually saying, you're welcome among my family. You're welcome here to be with my family, to be one of us. And so it is a, a very powerful demonstration of a heart of hospitality. So when you think about hospitality in those terms, you think about that what it's saying is welcome into my family and you understand uh, if, if you've been studying the Bible for a little while, if you've been uh, coming to church for a little while, you understand that, that this whole thing that, that we call following Jesus, Christianity, is really about a family that, that God is forming for himself through his son Jesus. The church is the family of God. And so, so it makes sense that hospitality really matters to God because we are a family that is growing, right? We're a family that, that God is constantly adopting new children into this family. So it makes sense that hospitality, opening your home and saying, come, be welcome in here among us, is a high value in the kingdom. So this morning, my, my desire is twofold. I, I want to expand our thinking about how hospitality affects our lives, the implications of hospitality in our lives, um, and then I want us to get more excited about it. That's my, that's my goal this morning, those two things. Before I go any further, let me just pray and, uh, and, and ask the Lord for his help. Father, we believe that your word is true, every bit of it. We believe that, that um, it's beneficial to us if we will hear it and take it in and receive it and be doers of your word. And so we ask, Lord, that as we just look 
into your scripture, into your word, that you would give us a heart to understand, take the veils off our eyes, and teach us. And Lord, anything that I say that is um, that is true, would you would you just pierce hearts with that? Would you help it to stick? Anything that I say, Lord, that's of my own wisdom, that's not of you, Lord, I pray it would just fall away. God, we want to be we want to be conformed to the image of your Son Jesus. We want to be transformed by your word and by truth, and truth alone. And so we ask you to do that in each one of us, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to imagine with me a young couple that's just been married. And uh, like a lot of young couples getting married, they're looking for a house. And the whole time they're looking for a house, they're looking for a house with a big enough kitchen and a big enough living room to host in. And they, the whole time they're looking, they, they're, they're thinking about this, this idea of hosting, having people over, feeding them. And they, they found a house with a great backyard where they can barbecue, and they imagine you know, having a barbecue with their friends. And they found sort of an open floor plan where they can get a good number of friends um, in the house with them, and so they buy the house, and the whole time they're decorating the house, they're thinking about, they're dreaming about, oh, let's, let's position the furniture. Let's, let's do everything in here to make this a welcoming home, a place where we can have people over. Because this couple, they think of themselves as hospitable people. And so they... they Finally, after two months of hard work, they get it done. They get it all set up, the furniture, they get, they get it decorated. And now let's fast forward two years. And let's look at that same couple two years later. This couple's still living in the same home. In the last two years, they've redecorated some things, they've painted some walls, they've gotten some new furniture. And over the last two years, They've had some close friends over a good bit. They've had their family over a lot. And other than that, it hasn't really been what they imagined. Over the last two years, they just, there's something missing. Now I want you to picture a church. And this church is trying to be hospitable. They're they're, they're trying to keep things clean and in order and in a welcoming environment. They're trying to have people outside greeting. They're trying to, um, they're trying to make everything that they do welcoming and hospitable because they think of themselves as a hospitable church. But, just like the young couple, there's something missing. There's something that's just not clicking. Both this young couple and this church that I've described, they love the idea of hospitality. But what they're missing is an actual heart of hospitality. And I see this rampant in our culture. I mean, most people, if you ask them, are you a hospitable person, they would say, yeah, sure. Because it's a great... It's, it's an idea that we love. But if you examine their life, if you examine these churches, they fall short of having a heart of hospitality. What they're doing is good. Preparing a space, thinking ahead, making a home that's welcoming is part of hospitality. That's good. That is important. It's just not the whole thing. Remember our definition. Philos means being actively friendly. Xenos means strangers. So part of being friendly, part of showing kindness is having a space that's welcoming and warm. Part of it is preparing a place to be hospitable. But that falls short. Hospitality is something that we do. It is an action. Hebrews 13.2 says, do not neglect to show hospitality. So it's, it's something that you do. You show hospitality. 
Romans 12, 13 says, practice hospitality. So hospitality is an action. But it isn't only an action. What I mean is that nothing that we're commanded to do in Scripture as followers of Jesus is only an action. It's not only a mindless duty. It's all, everything that we're commanded to do comes from the heart. And Jesus says from the, from the overflow, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, that everything that comes out of our lives is something that comes from the heart. And everything that we've been commanded to do in Scripture comes out of our identity in Jesus. I'll explain what I mean. So, so we are commanded to be hospitable, but it's because Jesus is hospitable. That's who he is, and we're one with him. We're commanded to build others up with our words, but that's because Jesus lovingly builds people up with his word, and we're one with him. We're commanded to be humble. That's, that's because Jesus did not count equality with God. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Right? We're commanded to set our minds on the things of the Spirit and not on the things of the flesh. Why? Because Jesus' mind is always the mind of the Spirit. And we're one with Him. So all of the commands that we're given in Scripture are rooted in Jesus and in who He is. And because we are one with Him, we are hospitable. So, if that's true, then hospi- hospitality must be rooted in Jesus, and we should be able to see that in the Scriptures, right? So, let's, let's look. In John chapter 1, starting in verse 35, and we have it on the screen if you have really good eyes. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God! The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. So he does. This passage gives us detail into how Jesus started his ministry of making disciples. The Gospel of John gives us a play-by-play like no other Gospel does as to how Jesus started his disciple-making ministry. It gives us a timeline. It says the next day. As you read the first uh, chapter and some of the second, you'll see this. The next day. The next day. So this is, this is actually happening really close together. And it's giving us detail that we don't see anywhere else as to how he began his ministry. You've got to imagine, Jesus, though he was God, was a man. I mean, he emptied himself of divine power and privilege, and he, and he does this thing as a spirit-empowered man on the earth. And the way that he begins the ministry that would change the world still changing the world today. The way that he begins that ministry is right here. And we just read it. 
And it is so simple that you, you almost just read right over it, right past it, and miss it. The way that he starts his ministry right here, this, at the beginning of this passage, by the way, if, you've been, if, you, if you start back and read through, he has zero disciples at the beginning of this. He's just started coming out, and he's kind of hanging around John the Baptist's ministry, which is this big, booming, growing ministry in the wilderness. John the Baptist has all these disciples, and Jesus has just started coming around. And when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he, he points people to him. This is the Lamb of God. This guy. And, um, and so that leads, in this passage we see him doing that. Look, the Lamb of God, right there. He's, he's pointing people to Jesus. And so two of his disciples go walking after him, following him. And um, Jesus is walking along. And let's not overcomplicate this. Here's what it says happens. He's walking along. He turns around and sees these guys walking behind him. He notices them. And so he speaks to them. He engages them and he says, what are you seeking? He asks them a question. Right? And they say, where are you staying? And then his words are, come and see. Come and you will see. What he, what he does here is so simple, we almost just read right past it. He invites them into the home that he's staying in. And they spend the day with him. He practices hospitality. Because that's who he is. He's a person who is others-oriented, who invites others into his life. He notices them, right? If, if Jesus doesn't notice them, then this story never happens. But it says that he saw them behind him. He notices them. He's paying attention. How many times are we walking by people all day long and we don't actually notice them? He notices them. So simple. He sees them. And because he sees them, he really notices them, he engages them. He asks them a question. What are you seeking? And you think that Jesus maybe knew? Maybe he knew what they were after. But, he, but he's engaging them. He's asking them a question. He's drawing them into conversation. And he invites them. Come and see. He doesn't immediately get into a theological discussion with them yet. He's, he's not going to jump into apologetics right now. He is starting at this very simple place of invitation. Come, hang out with me. Come, watch me. Come and see. Come and observe me. And something so simple leads to this domino effect. Starts with these, starts with these two disciples, right? And one of those happens to be Andrew, who is Simon Peter's brother. And so Andrew goes, man, We've got to go. And Jesus has created an environment that clearly, clearly it, Andrew realizes this is a welcoming place. Jesus wants more people coming here. And so he says, we've got to get more people to come and see Jesus. And so he goes and he finds his brother. And he says to Simon, Simon, we found him. And it says he brings his brother to Jesus. And then Jesus finds Philip, and then the same thing. He invites Philip in. Follow me. Come be with me. Hospitality. Come be with me. And Philip goes, wow. Other people have to experience this guy. They have to meet this guy. So he goes and he finds Nathaniel. And he says the same thing to Nathaniel that Jesus said to, to the first two disciples, come 
and see. We found him, come and see. Um, so he, so Jesus practices hospitality, and it begins this domino effect. John the Baptist kind of begins it right by like pointing people to Jesus. Look, there he is. Go, go look at him. Jesus continues it. Come and see. The first two say we found him. Andrew goes to Peter and brings him to Jesus. Jesus finds Philip. Philip says, come and see to Nathaniel. And so this hospitality, this act of hospitality, and this lifestyle of hospitality was, I believe, Jesus' strategy for beginning his discipleship ministry. And what struck me as I read it was the simplicity of it. Because I think we just, we, we have such a tendency to overcomplicate. How do we do this? I mean, how do we help God further the kingdom? And we, we overcomplicate it. Um, now, another reason that we don't, we don't do this well is that uh, we don't understand or we don't appreciate or both the gospel. And think about... Um, think about the gospel and what the gospel says about hospitality. The gospel is that God became a man, became one of us in the form of Jesus, dwelt among us, left heaven. Okay, we forget. Like, he had it made. He left heaven. He comes to earth. He dwells on this sin-filled, messed-up earth with us for 33 years. Then he dies in our place, takes our place on the cross, suffers in our place to rescue a people that were his enemies. It says that while we were yet his enemies, Christ died for us. And he did that also that we could be welcomed into his household, into his family. Right? You could say that hospitality is all about a willingness to inconvenience yourself for the sake of a stranger. Whether that's opening your home and welcoming them in or buying them a coffee or going out of your way to go and speak to them when you notice them, you could say hospitality is really all about inconveniencing yourself for the sake of a stranger. Look at Jesus. If anyone ever inconvenienced themselves for the sake of strangers, it was Jesus. He left heaven for strangers. He died for the sake of strangers. And so hospitality is rooted in the very nature of God, and it's rooted in the gospel. Now, I want to just say, because of the things that we're seeing in our country in these last weeks, that um, hospitality uh, and the gospel, they make it impossible for us to be prejudiced toward people who are not like us. It's, it's, it's painful and devastating to see the hatred that's in our nation. Um, racial prejudice is incompatible with the gospel. The illusion of racial superiority is incompatible with the gospel. We believe that from one man all nations came. We believe that God created all people in His image to reflect His glory. And so, it, it was so painful um, to watch how this hatred for people that are not like them is, is coming out of hearts and... Um, And I was thinking about it in terms of hospitality, you know, as I'm working on this. And 
and thinking about how hospitality is its love for the stranger. Right? It's it's compassion, it's active kindness, which is love for a person who's not like me, for the stranger. Um, and I, yeah, you know, when when I think about how does how how can our country move forward? What's what's the path forward? Um, Biblically, my understanding is that the church always leads the way. The church has to be the 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 church followers of Jesus have to say, "We are sinners, and um, we are we fall so short, and we have prejudices in us that we aren't even aware of." And we don't love our neighbor well. And the church leads the way with repentance. The church has to be first to say, uh, we have failed. And I was thinking about it in, in relation to last week's sermon. Last week I talked about um, self-focus. That we, we, if we aren't focused on Christ, we, we become self-focused. And, uh, and you may just call that pride, but I, the term self-focused is just, it's very specific as to how I, how I tend to drift. I, I, I just drift right back into self-focus. And as soon as we get self-focused, um, we start looking for goodness in ourselves. Right? We have to, if we're going to feel good. If we're not looking at Jesus. If we're self-focused, we have to look for some goodness in here. And, and I was just thinking about how that path leads you down to this idea, this illusion of racial superiority. Or like my people, people like me are, are the best. Because I have some goodness in me. Right? And the gospel... The gospel just destroys that lie. Right? The gospel tells us that we actually have no goodness in ourselves. That within our flesh there is no good thing, it says. That we have completely rejected God. We have completely turned from Him. We have fallen completely short of His glory. And so the gospel just tears down all of that lie of superiority and um, it says our righteousness is in Jesus alone. My righteousness comes from somewhere outside of me. And so I don't have to work to find goodness in me. I look to Jesus who is my goodness, my righteousness. And I don't have to, I don't have to uh, fall on self-preservation because Jesus he protects me. He preserves me. Um, I don't have to, to re- rely on some identity that I've found, that I've given myself to, because Jesus Christ is my identity. And um, in Jesus, I have this family, these brothers and sisters of all nations that the Bible says in Revelation, all nations are going to be gathered around the throne, worshiping Him together with one voice singing to Him. When we get that, when we understand the Gospel and, and, and what the Gospel says about who we are, then, then we can love people. We can really love people. We can... We can have pity on those that don't that have never heard about this wonderful news. We can um, we can be truly hospitable people that want others to come into our family because it is a good family 
with a perfect daddy. And that's what hospitality is ultimately about. It's about wanting other people that don't know our dad to be adopted by him. So, let's get really practical um, to wrap this up. I started out talking about the young couple and the, the church that likes the idea of hospitality, right, but doesn't get the heart. They've prepared their home. They love the thought of having people over. For some reason, it just never happens. The church loves the idea of having new people come in and, and, and hear about Jesus, but for some reason it's just not happening. So what, what do we do to make sure that isn't us? That's the big question, right? What do we do to ensure that that isn't us? Well, it starts with just being centered on the gospel, right? Like, like we just talked about. Just keeping the gospel forefront in our minds. That's where it begins, is just keeping our eyes on Jesus, who is our righteousness, who, who is hospitable, welcoming, loving, others-oriented. And then secondly, we ask, because we know that we have not because we ask not, it says in James. We, we need to ask for him to give us a heart of hospitality. It's not just We're not just going to... Um, it's not going to just appear out of nowhere. It's a gift, right? It's a fruit of the Spirit. And so we need to ask for that. Ask, ask Jesus who loves strangers, who loves people not like him, to give us his heart. Ask him to help us to see, to notice that person in our workplace or in our classroom or on our street that we haven't noticed before. And to give us a genuine concern for them. And then lastly, uh, I think just keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate. Don't complicate something that Scripture hasn't made complicated. And it's not complicated. It's as simple as noticing, engaging, and inviting. It's that simple simple. Jesus noticed these guys. He engaged me, asked them a question, and he invited them. Come and see. And I just, I, I just want to make this really clear. It's not hospitality until we get to invitation. That is what makes it hospitality. If Jesus hadn't got to the place where he said, come and see, the story ends. No hospitality. And so hospitality has to get to the place of invitation. And that's what causes the young couple that was married that wanted to have people over all the time. Why aren't there people in their home? They fail to invite. They love the idea. And they say, why don't we just never have people over? Why? Because they're not noticing, engaging, and inviting people. Why isn't the church that loves the idea of hospitality not growing, not seeing people coming in, because they are not inviting. They love the idea, they love having a place that's welcoming, and, uh, but they don't get to the place of come and see. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you heard me say, we had a team of people that went around conducting surveys all over the city, and all over this city in Burlington, they asked a couple hundred different people these questions. The last question was, if you had a close friend invite you to come to their church with them, would you go? And 80% of people said yes. And this is even people who, prior to that question, were like, not interested. It's not my thing. Most of them. Most people were, were responding that way. Not interested. It's not my thing. Don't do that. Then the last question, if you had a close friend invite you, would you go? 80% said yes. Amazing. Why didn't Jesus think, oh, wait a second, Jesus did think about this. 
Right? This is how he starts his ministry. Come and see. Just an invitation in. And that's what we mean. That's what I mean when I say we need to invite people to come and see. Come and, and hear about this Jesus. You know, if you have friends who know you're a Christian, who know you, you go to church every weekend, it's weird to them if you don't ever invite them. It's strange. It's like, is that really something that's important to you or not? It's odd if you don't invite them. We have friends that we're inviting and inviting, they still haven't come. I think they're going to. There was another study that said people come on the seventh invitation. <laughs> and I think we're at like five with one of our couple friends. And So, I mean, how, when, we usually give up after like two, right? Because it it's like, oh, it, we hate rejection. But it's the seventh invitation before people will come. So, as simple as this is, it's, it was the strategy of Jesus in the very beginning of his ministry of disciple making. Come and see. And that led to others saying, we found him, come and see. We found him, come and see. And that, that leads to what we know today as Christianity. I just, I want to leave you with this thought. If, if you've read the New Testament, you know that this guy that we just read about, Simon, who Jesus says, um, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, this guy is the guy that Jesus at the end of his ministry on earth says, Peter, on this rock I will build my church. Peter ends up being the, the leader of the apostles. He's the head of the church after Jesus ascends into heaven. Okay? What if, I mean, let's just think about this. What if Andrew, his brother, had decided not to go to him and say, hey, we found him. Come and see. Such a small thing. It seems so insignificant, an invitation. But I don't think I'm overly, I'm, I'm, I'm overthinking this. What if he hadn't gone to him? And then I want you to think, who do you know? Who is in your life that needs an invitation? How might God see them? Who... Who is it that God sees that they might be in the kingdom? What are the things that God might do with that person if you will just simply go to them and say, hey, I found him. Come and see. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that it isn't complicated. Lord, Yes, we know that there is need for us to, to have a reason for the hope that is within us, that there is, there, there is a real need for uh, a deep knowledge of your word. God, but we also see that there is also a simplicity to this that we often miss. And we ask you just to help us... Um, not to make things more complicated than you make them. We ask that you would help us, Lord, to have eyes to notice the people in our lives that they're there. We ask for help to have the boldness to engage them, and speak to them, and ask them questions to draw them in. And we ask for, Lord, the, the compassion, the love, the care that they're there, And, Lord, that as we step out and, and seek to be a hospitable church, that you would give us a genuine heart of hospitality, and that you would add to our number, add to the number of your church in this city for your glory, Lord, for the sake of your kingdom. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.